Hey, everybody, Charles Dobbins here for the next version of the Multifamily Investing Academy podcast. I'm here with, okay, Kevin, how do you pronounce your last name? <laughs> I was like, dude, he's, he's going for it. This is awesome. Not, okay, but <laughs> listen, everyone screws up my last name. Kevin Amalsh. Well, that was good. It's Amalsh, but that Amos. was very close. Yeah, fantastic. Look at mine. It's either Dobbins or Dobbins. And it's like, no, it's... It's Dobbins. We spell it incorrectly. We spell it. We know we do. But it was an Ellis Island bastardization of the name D-O-B-B-I-N-S is the way I, I pronounce it. So Amos. But wait a minute. Okay. Because I'm a, I'm a huge fan of last names. What's the derivation of the name Amos? Where this is that is from, from? This is from Germany. Okay. Yeah, I get it. That makes sense. But I would... Do they really use long A's a lot? I don't think, you know, it's so funny you say that, Charles, because my uncle, like, traced back all the ancestors all the way until we came across the pond. And so he was in Germany visiting the Amos group, and they laughed at him on how he pronounced it. So I was right. It I was right. I, was, I knew I was right. I knew I was right. Oh, that's so cool. Isn't that I funny? That. I was like, yeah. are you serious? I grew up this whole time thinking nope. that's how we pronounce it. Yep, but. yep, exactly. That's so funny. That is so funny. <laughs> oh my gosh, that I pronounced it correctly because, of course, I got a D plus in German <laughs> freshman year at Boston College. Yes, and uh, and I know that we didn't really say the A all uh, that long, uh, that much in, in the li very little German that I learned uh, getting my D plus. Um, you know, I knew that like Amos, Amos. Awesome. You're the only one that's ever challenged uh, that. Yeah, and no. I, I, I think you're right, but <laughs> I love that. Adolf. It was not Adolf, it was Adolf. Right, right. Oh, come on. Come on. Even you know. Now, that. He wasn't even German, though. Oh, 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 oh. spoken like a true German. <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. All right, so what'd you do in the service? Uh, infantry. Were you I really? Was, uh, yeah, I was actually a mortar mortarman. So I don't know if you know what that is, but oh, you oh dropped yeah. up. Yeah, shoots. yeah, yeah. Okay, so you were you were um, like, and then you, you got out of there and you went to went to Wall Street. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I, wanted... I worked at a big high rise downtown, analyzing mortgage bonds before. Now, how'd you end up? Now, where'd you go? Where were you when you went into the service? Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Colorado. Yeah, I was born in Denver, grew up in a Western suburb. Okay, so how'd you end up in New York? Well, I worked for Wall Street firms. I was working in, a, uh, the offices were here in Denver. It was kind of picture like a big call center, except for we didn't take calls. We just analyzed bonds, but it was just a big center with a bunch of cubicles. Okay, and okay, but, just, but, but was it in Wall Street or was it a Wall Street firm? So we were analyzing bonds for Wall Street. So the, the clients oh, okay, were like okay, the credit okay, okay. suites. And some so you weren't sitting on, on Lehman you know, Brothers, all of them. You weren't on, you know, Madison Avenue or something like that. No, 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 no. Oh, okay. Our, good, our good. clients were Wall Street firms. Gotcha. 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 Okay. So now you get out. Did I do my? No. I, all right. Anyway, uh, did, you got out of uh, that gig yeah. and you set up the Pine Financial Group. Yeah, so I was actually starting working with, her name was Susan. I started working with a partner. I call her a partner. She okay. thinks it's more of her firm. I was working for her. I guess it was more yeah. like that. And she was kind of teaching me the business as I was working for, it was Murray Hill at the time. And then they changed the name to Clayton and then it went public. Okay. Um, but I was working for that big firm while I was learning this business. And that way, when I got out, I was like, corporate America, I can't do it. So yeah. I got out and- I already had this lined up, so it was easy, easy transition for me. Okay, okay, cool. Very cool. All right. So you do that, you make the switch, but now you're doing, you know, yeah. you're a loan broker, you're a mortgage broker, yeah. essentially. I mean, exactly I don't, right. Yeah, yeah I don't back know. before the SAFE Act, back before all of the regulation, it was wild, wild west. Okay, but wait a minute. What year were we talking about? 2006. <gasps> oh my gosh, you survived. <laughs> I made it. You did. <laughs> welcome. Welcome, young man. Because, listen, we've all been through it. But I got to tell you, we're about to do it again. Oh, yeah. I think so, too. It's not going to be anywhere near what we've experienced. Oh, before. I think it's going to be worse. I went so? to a, yeah, I went to the IMN 
dot uh, dot org uh, credit credit uh, officers and loan workout specialists convention you know as much of a as much of a fun convention these guys can have I went to it because I knew that listen I've been through this before 2008 2009 I lost my shirt I'm, I'm going to do a, a webinar uh, in the next couple of days where I'm going to I'm really peel back the layers of, of the onion and tell people what I went through back during those days and um, uh, sitting in that conference with for two days with these people talking about what's coming up they're talking that it's worse than before. That the government has yeah, been yeah. But look at the room you're in. I mean, they're they're that's a, the room. Of oh, I know, there. I know. But think about it. They're the they're the guys that are saying like, they get a phone call from uh, FDIC saying, "How much can you handle?" Oh, well, we got about three workout officers. Well, we've got seventeen hundred. Uh, we've got seventeen hundred loans. Uh, in foreclosure right now we're anticipating 1.7 over the next two years and like that's the fdic yeah that's so what that's they, more on the commercial side then right oh yeah oh listen it's hitting yeah. everybody it's 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 um they're all saying that this is going to get get really really ugly uh and they're trying they can't do the same things they did before they can't hide these loans in big you know tranches and they're just you know they're just you you're not going to be able to to uh um what's what was the word that we have faking faking uh or uh oh i'm trying to remember the term i was actually a a, a beneficiary of this particular term where they 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 try to fake the numbers that keep it kicking down the kicking the can down the road um they, they put one of my loans into a, a an a and b situation you know just so that it, it complied with the uh with the um uh the credit the bank uh the, the local it was a michigan lender uh it was um the bank examiners came in said this this loan no longer complies it your this loan is in default because it, it the uh the debt doesn't support the, the collateral does not support the loan and so they they carved it up into an a loan and a b loan and so you know that saved my saved my bacon by them yeah, doing yeah the different so, tranches so exactly. that's what i used to do when i was working for the wall street firms they were buying that stuff right yeah. so i was in it i got out before the crash but i was analyzing those exact bonds that went defunct yeah i could tell the the foreclosure numbers you're talking about surprised me a little bit that sounds very much commercial which yeah. i do expect to see a wave of those because they're all short-term loans yeah. and now that the interest rates are so high they won't dscr they won't cut the debt coverage well yes so okay hold on, hold on hold on hold on hold on i know what you're saying but but some people on my on my podcast may not know they won't dscr in other words they won't cover the debt service coverage ratio right. once yeah, so it used to be it used to be a bank when you hit your term so let's say it's a they're almost all 20 to 25 year amortization or amortized loans, right? For 25 right. years, but they would have a term of maybe five years or maybe yeah. seven years. Yeah. And after that five years was up, they would just redo the loan. It would just either modify it or refinance you or extend or whatever. So commercial investors weren't worried about these five year terms. They would just, the bank would just redo it. Well, now the bank can't redo it because of debt service coverage ratio is not the 1.2 that they require. 1.2 just means that it can cover 120% of the debt. The income from the asset can cover the debt. Now it's gonna be under one, so it doesn't qualify. And now they can't close the deal because it's a violation uh, of their guidelines. So well, now what do you do with that loan? Now they have to accelerate it. Accelerate it means call it due. Now they're accelerating these loans and they're forcing it into foreclosure we're not seeing that charles on the residential side no, not yet not yet but uh, yeah but let me let's stay on the commercial side for a moment because what happens if it does using your term terminology if it does dscr because listen all of my loan i never missed a mortgage payment not once i i all of them but when the note came due because the cap rates had risen I, I couldn't, I did not have the 80, 80, 20 LTV and I didn't even have the 70% LTV. So what happens in that case? Well, that's where the, that's the big question mark, right? See 2008, this doesn't even compare to that. And I, we, we could talk about reasons for that, but the, 
The main reason is we're being pushed into a recession by the government. This is very much more like the savings and loan crisis, which we had, you know, we had 18% interest rates yeah. and that was in, in order to slow inflation. So that's, that's very much more similar to what we're in now than yeah. the crash that's in 2008, true. where we were writing shitty loans. We're not, it's not like that now. No, that's a good point. That's a very good point because totally, I mean, if we learned or they learned better underwriting guidelines back, mm -hmm. uh, you know, since 2008, they weren't making stupid loans. But, you know, you're right. The cost of money is going up so much. It, it just, but here's the thing is the cost of money is just a number within the equation. So if the cost of money continues to go up, the DSCR changes. And when that happens, it's just, uh, you know, by default, the cap rates start to rise. Yeah, they have to. They have to, exactly. And when that happens, then all of a sudden the valuations come down and these people, right. you know, they can't get their they can't get their money out. They they, yeah, they so the, yeah, yeah. the solution here to answer your question is they need to come up with the investor that owns that loan or has that loan on their asset has to come up with a difference, right? They need to come up with more money to put into the deal to lower the mortgage okay. payment. Okay, hold on. When easier. hold on. When you say the investor, you're not talking about the the lender oh, investor. Right. You're talking about the the actual owner of the property. Yeah, the owner of the property, not the loan. I misspoke there. Right. Not the owner yeah. of the loan. It was the owner of the property that the loan is attached to. Right. And that's they're gonna have to come up with cash. And a lot of them they won't can't. be willing to, or they can't. Well, exactly. I mean, on one of my nicest properties, on one of my nicest properties, I would have had to raise an additional million dollars on a property that was not even valued as much as. The first property, the, the property was when I got my first million on the deal, right? I would be in for 2 million now, the same property. And this is, I mean, this is obviously, you know, I, I oh, and I'm going to give you a punchline of this whole thing in a moment. Uh, and this, this is going to be my punchline on my pod, on my webinar. But, but obviously these people are not going to do it. They're just going to say, you know, this is, and the beauty of, all of this, the beauty, which is kind of a sad thing to say, mm -hmm. but this is how the rich get richer and you know, right. smart get smarter. Uh, the beauty of it is that at the end of the day, I could just turn around and drop the keys on the bank's desk and walk away because I did everything right. There was never any bad boy provisions being, being uh, you know, triggered. And it was a non-recourse loan, right. and we just shook hands. And and and, and then, you know, I'll tell you something. The, one of the things that the bank said on our way out the door was, "We're really surprised you survived as long as you did. We thought you'd give up a lot sooner." <laughs> I should have. <laughs> I should have. I absolutely should have. And when he said that, I was like, "Does that get me any credit with you guys?" No, like, no, nope, no, nope, nope, not one bit. Not one bit. See you next time, young man. See you next time. Oh, funny. Yeah, but uh, okay. So here's here's the punchline, and this is this is how I'm going to close my webinar coming up. It's um okay. So I I was on the I'm on this uh, uh webinar show called the Shark Pool, uh, the multifamily Shark Pool, and I'm one of the sharks. I'm the mean shark, by the way, just so you know. So <laughs> so true, and it's so easy. Some of these people are just doing stupid loans, stupid deals. And so um, I, uh, this guy gets on, yeah, two, two guys, they own a portfolio in North Carolina and Lexington, Kentucky. So as soon as he said Lexington, Kentucky, my ears perk up. And they said, we're looking to do this portfolio in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm like, okay, all right, I know Louisville. And I start watching the guy and, they, and he starts putting up the pictures of his portfolio, North Carolina, Raleigh, everything, Lexington, Kentucky, and he put puts up the picture of a property. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Oh my. So I said, I kept my mouth shut and I let the guy go through his whole spiel. He's a young guy. I was like, well, I uh I've worked four years on the HUD trading desk. And so though I underwrote, I know how to underwrite these deals. I'm like, first off, my first question is. What the hell is the HUD trading desk? I don't know. And I don't care. And then he goes like, 
and uh, we were very conservative in our analysis. And we've actually, tr uh, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? When you uh, print, we 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 stress test uh, this deal so that the interest rates can go up a point and a half and this deal will still particularly fly. And based upon everything that I understand, we're never gonna get interest rates to go up that much. So I think this deal is gonna be a very, very good deal. And so I'm listening to the guy, I'm like, oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure it is. And then I said, hey guys, um, very well, you know, let me just, can you go back a couple of slides? Can you put that picture of, uh, Lexington, Kentucky, back up on the on the on the screen there, and so he puts a puts a property up on Lexington. He says, yeah, 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 that one. Hold it right there. Hold it right there. And let me tell you a story. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Kevin, you look like you know where this one's going. I kind of feel like I know the punchline, but I'm dying. Like you got me in the you know edge. The, oh, I, you, I you know the punchline, but let me give you the build up because you're gonna love the story. So the guy goes through. I said, back in 2008. I put together a nice syndication deal. And we purchased a $7.5 million multifamily property in Lexington, Kentucky. It was actually 222 units. And as soon as I said that, their eyes went out bug-eyed because how many 222 unit right. properties are there in Lexington, Kentucky? They knew, and they're like, I said, that two months after I bought that property, Fanny and Freddie filed for bankruptcy. And my valuation on that property never came back. And the interest rates went up and the cap rates went up. And I never could justify that valuation ever again. And the guy says, you owned Preakness Apartments? And I said, yes, I did. And I said, hold on one second. Let's see what happened to this property. And so I'm on CoStar as I'm online. And I'm, I'm, I punch it in and I'm able to pull up the sales history. And Kevin, I'm not kidding you. These, what I'm about to say to you are absolutely real numbers. I bought it for 7.5 in 2000 and seven, seven or eight, I can't remember. A year or almost a year and a half later, we couldn't make a go of it. A whole host of problems, totally different lesson on that one. We had to give it back to the bank, gave it back to the bank at 6.5 million, okay, which was essentially our down payment and the mortgage amount. So they took it back for the mortgage amount, 6.5. A year later, the special servicer sold it for $3 million mm -hmm. to an individual. Some guy wrote a check for $3 million. Three years later, he sold it to these guys for $7.5. Oh, yes. Yep. I borrowed the money from the bank to give to that guy. That's essentially what happened. And, and you know, I didn't get hurt. It just set me back years. Yeah. But this guy was on the right side of the, of, the, uh, of the crash and did everything right. And this is what I'm teaching my students now. Guys, sit back, keep your powder dry. It's going to happen again right now. And, and those guys paid my price uh, to own that same property four or five years after I owned it. And and some guy walked away with a pound load of cash. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's all documented. It's all like, wow. this is real. What I'm telling you is absolutely real. So and I'm going to show it on, on, a, on a webinar because I want people to see this is how millionaires get made in a recession. This is why Warren Buffett is the smartest man alive. Just, you know, sit back and wait. And so, uh, yeah, so that's that's what happened to me. That's what happened to me. Don't you find it so interesting that we get ourselves into a mess <clears throat> as a country and then we try to spend our way out of it because we don't want too much separation of wealth. So we start writing checks to people who are middle class, lower middle class, lower class, oh. 
trying to keep everything together. And then all we do by doing this, Charles, is create a bigger separation of wealth. Oh. Because guess what? At some point, that bill is due. Yes. Yeah. Now. And, and it's those people that have to pay it. That's exactly On, what on their doing. backs. It okay. is, it's, you know, I got to tell you. Who borrows you, money? The rich or? Yeah. Yeah. And when do you think? Now. Let me ask you this. And we're, we're, get, we're starting to get philosophical here, but when in your mind do you think this problem started in this country? I think I have a point. Uh, I think Ray Dalio talks about it in one of his books. But when do you think we really lost our way as a country? Gosh, that's such a great question. And I'm just, I'm, I studied the 1990 oh. crash. So okay, let me, let, me, let me back it up and I'll throw you out my answer. You can comment on it. Okay. I think when when um, Nixon took us off the gold standard and we got to be able to write checks without without an overdraft charge f as a country, and I, I really think from that point on we lost our way. Our government has just been going crazy. If our federal government had to run like all the states then, you know, we would not be in this financial situation that we are. People would just be a lot smarter. Credit has gotten crazy. Right, right. Yeah. And so I was thinking 1990 because of the bailouts of the savings and loans. Yeah. The government just started writing checks to, to banks to bail yeah. them out. And, and you know what? They were expecting it. I'm going to make yeah. these loans, these suspect loans, so I could profit from it. And when they go bad and all of our depositors want their money back and there's a run on the bank, it's okay because the government will take care of me. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, fraud. okay, okay. All right. You know what? I just thought of something else. And you might have just corrected me. It wasn't so much Nixon, but it was when the FDIC was created. Somebody else also said that the FDIC has done more damage, damage. to this country than anything else because – if you were a business and you knew that you did business with customers and no matter who you did business with, you couldn't lose. That's right. Because the government would always step in and save your save. And they your have ever since the 90s crash, right? Yeah. Yes, exactly. And that's that's why we're in the situation that we're in. And you know what's scary is that you have this FDIC insurance. So let's put our money in the savings account because we know it's insured. Yeah. We don't have anywhere near enough insurance. To cover all of these deposits. And who's, this is but, the biggest Ponzi scheme in the history of Ponzi schemes. And you and I are participating. I know. I We're know. all participating in it. We won't, we won't go work with a bank that doesn't, that isn't working in that Ponzi. Let's be really safe and put our money in a CD that earns 3%, which is eroding at 8%. But don't worry, it's safe because yeah. there's FDIC insurance. I know. Yeah. It makes yeah. no sense. Yeah, we are, I tell you. I don't know. I don't know where the, I don't know where it's all going to end. And but you know what? Here, Kevin, I'll be dead. Let my kids do it. My my kids are living a pretty nice life now. Let their la last half of their life be be all screwed up. You know, like hey, you enjoyed it long enough. Now pay the piper. So it is. Yeah, do you think that going off the gold standards was scary? What about the uh, decentralized currency that the government's now inventing? So <laughs> let's see where this goes. This is going to end well. Oh, this is, oh, this whole FTX thing. And you know what? Serves them all right. And it just goes to show you, it all ties back into your control of Washington. If you're able to control a couple of senators, you can do whatever you want. What a disgrace. What an absolute disgrace. Yep, it's all about the money. It's all, I, you know, my college roommates, are, I, I, I'm not going to mention any names. It narrows it down to like four people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> My college roommate is a, uh, a lobbyist in Washington, most jaded person. He went in there all happy and big smiles on his face. Can't wait to get out. Most yeah. jaded person you can ever okay. imagine. And he says, he says it best. He says, Charlie, you want to meet your lob your uh, your uh, congresswoman, uh, congressman uh, for lunch or your senator for lunch? They won't even take your call. I can pick up the phone call today and call them and be eating lunch with them in 10 minutes if I wanted to. And that's it. That's just the name of the game. And, and nobody, like, people are too busy having to go out there and make a living to, to, to you know, see all the, 
all the corrupt, uh, corruption that goes on. So, so bad. But, oh my God. Uh, all right, Kevin, Kevin. You've been so patient. We got off a little track there. We did. No, this is, I needed this. I needed this right now. Um, so, listen, uh, you were kind enough to, and patient enough to wait for me. So, so let's talk about Pine Financial Group. So, what, let, let, listen, I, and, I, and on the multifamily side, what do you guys do on the multifamily side? Talk to me. Yeah, we, we love multifamily, but here's the thing, Charles, that I've seen with multifamily is cap rate compression because it's a crowded business. <clears throat> There's lots of people that want to get involved. Um, which is like your coaching. It sounds like a lot of a lot of investors that want to be doing multifamily. Yeah, I love the space. It feels really safe to me. People need a place to live. You got one roof. You got lots of economies of scale. It's just a tough business to get into from my perspective because of the cap rates. Yeah, we're seeing a lot more action on big industrial conversions. Okay, hold, on, hold on one second. We said because of the cap rates, meaning that what you've seen over the last couple of years is cap rate compression. That yes. the prices are just not making sense. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make no, sense. People are paying turn paying you know sub four percent or sub four caps for turnkey stuff. And I mean, this is across the nation, but specifically in Denver where I live. Denver's crazy. I can't believe how many how much people are paying for these. And now we're seeing interest rates go up. So now now what's going to happen? You're paying a three point seven five, let's say cap, and you're at a seven percent interest rate when you refinance yeah. that thing i don't know how that works no it doesn't but they'll keep doing it they'll keep it's stupid well, money we'll see, we'll doing see it. right according yeah. to you or what you believe we're going to see much higher cap rates on this space which i agree yeah um, but we need that and some lower interest rates i think to make it viable yeah, yeah. exactly which will bring people back in is yeah. when they get that arbitrage between the two so you're absolutely right um, yeah, that uh, those cap rates, especially in, in Colorado, I mean, and, and um, it's ridiculous. Oh, it's nuts! It doesn't make any sense. And but here's the thing, Kevin. This is this is what I always say: um, the people who are in this business for the transactional m money are in it for the absolute wrong reason. And what I mean by that are those people. And Kevin, I'll tell you. That deal that I told you about in Lexington, Kentucky, I walked away from that closing table with almost a quarter of a million dollars in my pocket. You can imagine when I heard rumblings, I didn't want to hear it because I wanted that quarter million bucks. Exactly. Yeah. I wasn't doing it probably so much for the benefit of the investment. I was doing it for the transactional money that I would make on that deal. And anyone that's doing the deal for those reasons, they should run. They shouldn't just walk. They should run from that deal. Walk away from that big payday at the closing table because over time, it's going to set you back like you can't imagine as an investor. And I'll, I'm that, that's just personal experience telling you and screaming it out, like, don't do it, just don't do it. Well, it's almost a conflict of interest if you're talking about a syndication. <laughs> You know what? That's a great point. That's a great point. And that's something that all people looking to buy into syndicated deals should take into consideration. And especially the amount of the, the, the acquisition fee that's involved. I mean, mine was about two and a half, three percent, which wow. is, I know, you say, wow, back in the heyday, that was what they were paying. I know that one guru had set up his own fund and was keeping 5%. Now, that just tells you that all you're dealing with are stupid investors. Because can you imagine if you took that deal to Wall Street and tried to get it funded at 5% acquisition? They'd say like, ah, oh, yeah, nice, nice try, young man. We're not going to give you 5%. Because think about what you have to do in valuation of the property to recruit that 5%. Totally. Exactly. Yeah. And then when you exit, you probably have an exit fee and then you have your realtor commissions and you have all of these other fees. So now you really have to. That takes away from the, 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 the uh, distribution at the end of the day for, you know, the sale of the property. Yeah. yeah. And I invest my own cash in real estate all the time. So outside of pine, and yep. if I look at a syndication or some type of passive investment like that, I want to know how the operator is getting compensated and yeah. is are they incented to make this property perform or is right. it, like you said, is it a fee-based business model? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I think that's what a lot of these people, when I was doing that that uh, that uh, shark pool, I could not, 
I looked at these deals. I'm like, don't do it. Just don't do it. Not only do don't don't anyone here on this call invest your money in this deal, but you syndicators don't do it. You're going to lose. You're going to be tied up. You know, and of course, I saw one syndication with like ten GPs, and like every husband and wife investor group was a part of the GP. And let, let me tell you something. I was involved in a situation like that, and here's how it ends up. Once they realize they're not going to make a dime on the deal because the prop the valuations have have tanked, who's going to stay in it? That's right. If you've got no money, that why would you stay in it? And you have no recourse because you had a big down payment, and it's exactly. all that's at risk is the money that's in the deal, which isn't their money. Exactly, exactly. And I saw that so often, so often, and it's just like all the only reason why you folks are doing this is twofold. You're hoping it continues to rise in value, and you want to be able to put on your in real estate resume that you are a GP of a 200 unit apartment complex so that you can get into the next one on your own. And that's why they do it. God, it makes me, uh, I've seen it all a million times. And it's amazing to me that some of these gurus are out, still out there pitching that, that, that structure. And it's just so wrong. Absolutely wrong. You got to build a business the right way. You got to do it from the ground up and, uh, and, and just do smart deals. And if you can't find any, keep looking. Yeah. Don't do it. Keep looking, right. You know? Yeah, I love what you're telling your students to keep the powder on the sideline and yep. you know, just be patient. You got to be patient right now. Yep. Those cap rates will come up. The, oh, they will. They have to. They absolutely. Oh, to. hey. Okay. You want to hear it? Let me uh, see if I can find Let me. Uh, uh, and you might be buying them from the special servicers. Exactly. Oh, that's, I went to that conference and that's, that's, these guys were saying, you know what they were saying, which was really interesting was, um, I said, well, who do you want to work with in these scenarios? And the guy said uh, something that was that had everybody in the whole room going, huh? Um, and, and what they said was, we like to sell these deals to the farmer next door. And I was like, huh? What is, what's the farmer next door? Farmer next door is the guy next door to the property they, they just took back the farm they just took back, who understands the value of that property more than anyone else does and is willing to pay the right value for it in such a way that the bank will never have to hear about this again. Well, that's a nice way to say that it's more valuable to them and they're going to pay you more. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Farmer next door. That's how they put it. Um, okay. So let me, let me read you this. You're going to love this one. Uh, so this company that I use, I was in a partnership and they, um, its company's name is Offered.com, O-F-F-E-R-D.com, spelled incorrectly, just for, for the record. And he says, as you and we all know at this point, the multifamily party is over. After years of cheap money combined with high leverage, conditions have turned like a predator smelling blood. Here are a few examples of what we've seen. And would love to hear your experiences. Listen to this, okay? This I, I knew this was coming. And the numbers that he's giving are like stratosphere-like numbers, not your typical, you know, lender or borrower. Um, you know, these are huge numbers. He says, in Texas, we sourced a new construction asset off market in the second quarter with pricing guidance at 95 million. By the third quarter, that guidance had dropped to 75 million. We originally submitted an LOI at 70 million, and now even that price is hard to pencil. He said, and one more, it gives a bunch of money. I'm gonna give you one more. In Oklahoma, there was a portfolio that went to market at 34 million in the second quarter, but had a failed campaign. We contacted the owners off market and pricing guidance had dropped to 30 million. Ultimately, it went under contract for 27 million. It's just a numbers game. Yeah, it hasn't even closed yet. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's scary. I know. I know. So, so what are you guys doing? Well, we're what, I mean, what are you doing as far as like first off, the toughest thing for you for you, how are you able to peg the cap rates for the deals you're looking at? Yeah, what and I'll just be real can candid with you. 
we're 80 percent residential 20 percent commercial so we do okay. have commercial exposure yeah everything we do is value add so if there's not we don't do any turnkey if it's a fully occupied functioning property we're not even yeah. getting close to it yeah okay so we're looking for the you know big capex we're looking for big tenant improvements looking for that one lease that's going to really add the value to the property okay. those are the types of transactions we're looking for multifamily and we do, we're not seeing a lot of multifamily because of the cap rate compression, right? There's just, okay. it's pretty crowded. So we're seeing yeah. a lot more, I mentioned industrial, uh, going from uh, big box to small bay. We're seeing a lot of that uh, type of conversion. We're, just... we're seeing a lot of retail, uh, st vacant strip malls and that kind of thing. I would love Charles to be doing more multifamily. I feel very comfortable there. I've got a background in residential as I've been doing residential for two decades. So I feel very okay. comfortable Oh, I was going to say, you said big box to small bay. Yeah. Okay, that's really interesting because I, I have uh, I have lunch with a broker every quarter in, uh, up here in my town um, on southern New Hampshire. And he said something. I said, what, what's, like, if I went to so, so look to build something, what would I, what should I build? He says, small bay, industrial, like, like they, they'll, they'll, even before they're built, I can have them all sold people are dying for that space they we they just industrial companies they just don't have that construction companies they are looking for that so you're saying if you can find a large large box and then be able to slice and dice it up into into uh um you know do a little rehab on it for for that type of thing that would that would be a good good deal for you yeah, exactly. Same with retail. I mean, you, you look at like Best Buy, for example, a lot of those are going out of business, right? So you're seeing a lot of vacant vacancy there. And then you can see that chopped up into maybe it's a neighborhood gym and then a couple mom and pop service type companies. Interesting. Or, or the conversion from something larger to smaller. And it's because the price per foot goes way through the, it goes to the roof, right? You might have a market for big box at a buck 50 a foot or something like that. That might be two, two and a quarter a foot if you get it to less than five thousand feet. So we're seeing we're seeing a big value adds there. Interesting. But those Best Buys, those tend to be like in a mall situation, aren't they? Are you seeing yeah, them stand standalone? Well, I mean, you do? yeah, we're seeing standalone. Uh, and that was just one example. I mean, we just did one maybe two years ago. I thought it was genius. It was an old Safeway, and they converted a Safeway into a swim school and a like a Vasa Fitness. And so they went one big box into two two smaller. Okay, they killed it. They killed it. Kevin, I'm I'm up here from the. I live up there in New England, and we're pretty provincial. We don't know what a Safeway is. We don't know. What uh, that is. Kroger. You know. Okay. That <laughs> no, that's still Michigan. That's still kind of. Uh, 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 what else? We got? Albertsons, it, maybe. <laughs> what? What did you say? City Al Market, Albertsons. You know. Albertsons. Oh my God! You are so. <laughs> you are so Midwest. You are so that you, you you don't even know that there's an ocean out there beyond, <laughs> beyond the Mississippi. So that's funny. <clears throat> oh but yeah. So we're but uh, as I mentioned, we're doing mostly the fix and flip stuff. I feel very comfortable there, especially going into this recession, which we haven't really got into that. But we're yeah. not seeing the foreclosures on the residential side. Are we seeing they're hiding them? They're hiding them. You think so? Yep. Well, I sat and listened to this room full of guys saying, "Like, we know, we know it's coming." And th th let me tell you one other thing. I where is it before. coming from? Because we have, first of all, we could use the inventory, so we can absorb quite a bit of that. But if, where is it coming from? We have record high credit scores. We have record high equity positions beyond anything we've seen in history. Yeah. There's more lots debt. of more... room here. No consumer debt. Okay. You, you got to go watch this guy, Nick Grilly, Grilsey or something. I can't, I can't remember his last name. Reventures.com, Reventures.com on YouTube. The guy just came out with a, with a, um, uh, the guy every th three weeks, he stopped doing it because he was so ahead of the curve. And now he said, everybody's jumping on my bandwagon. I'm getting off the bandwagon. And it, he is the guy that's been calling for the housing crash. I interviewed Ivy Zellman of Zellman Associates of Walker Dunlop uh, almost over a year ago. And she said, we got a housing crisis here in the, house, in, the in the country. I said, Ivy, what are you talking about? You have, and she's, we have a housing crisis. You go and you look at the numbers that these What's guys the are talking crisis? about. What is it? Okay, it, the crisis is that rents are coming down. Rents have already started to come down on all these homes. 
that the demand that the, the we have now had a for the first time in a long time a flat uh, household creation number we're not creating new households so people are not buying new things no, that's true we have, we have over 900,000 units in production waiting to go online in this country and the demand is dec decreasing it is going to be catastrophic like you've never seen before so is she talking about a micro level in some market that i don't know okay so okay great question she wasn't ivy was not but if you go and, and watch uh nick on our ventures he yeah, talks about which 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 markets this is going to impact the most like he said the tertiary and the secondary markets as usual they don't have these crashes like other parts do he said the, the the cities that had the greatest amount of development and also the greatest amount of investor capital coming in if you're a homeowner an owner occupied unit in a, in a city you're going to see less pro fewer problems uh, if it's an investor owned property, they're going to start dumping these properties like you can't imagine. Because as the interest rates go up, they, they're they not going to be able to afford it. They're going to look to get out of it. They're going to move their money. They're going to just dump these. You've seen it happen uh, with Zillow in Phoenix with 2,500 homes being dumped out there. But those particular places that have, have climbed the fastest, that have developed the most, that have had, the, had more investor capital come in, uh, Phoenix, uh, Denver, uh, Austin, Miami, and Atlanta. Atlanta, he says, is going to be a disaster, absolute disaster. So, and he, the guy, I love the way he analyzes this stuff. It, he's, he, he pulls out all the charts, you know, real market, um, you know, apartment, uh, apartmentlists.com. He pulls it all out and shows you what's, what's going on. And it's just fascinating. Absolutely fa fascinating. So are we talking about multifamily stuff now okay you see that's a great question because now i feel like i'm being interviewed on my own <laughs> well i'm just trying to learn here and i disagree with you and i know oh my I gosh come, so oh let me tell, tell you something trying tell. to understand what i'm missing no kevin oh hold on i'm getting my hold on i'm getting my my seat is about to get caught in one of my <laughs> one of my tires here um no i totally agree with you because I was the same way when Ivy was oh, on yeah. the podcast. Money just being poured into build to rent products. Why would we be having institutional investors pouring money into build to rent single family if there's no rental demand? They're they're, they're, they're smarter oh, than we are. Oh no 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 no! Don't think that for a second. Look at the numbers. I mean, for Ivy said this. Nick Nick is saying it. And it, you oh, ask me that question again because you, you asked me that question. I said I said I oh you said I'm not seeing it. I I said I said Kevin. I was the exact same way. I was the exact same way. And I've been following it and following it and following it. It is absolutely fascinating to me that, you know what? It's it's happening. It's it's happening. Well, let me ask you this. I've when, done this before. These Ivy and these other people you've talked to, when do they say interest rates will peak? Oh, What's their prediction there? Okay. Um, they're thinking that, okay, so what's going to happen? If you're looking to get in the stock market again, what you want to buy is, you know, buy short in the stock market because- what happens, and this is what Nick said in uh, in the uh, in his thing, is that over the last eight cycles, whenever the Fed has gotten involved in increasing interest rates in order to, to tame inflation, there is always a time when they uh, they go back on the interest rates. So there will be a, a point where they'll they'll drop the interest rates in order to attempt to 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 get things back to normal. And at that point, on every every uh, market cycle for the last eight times, the stock market has continued to fall for the next 18 to 24 months. So get into those funds that buys buy short on the stock market, and you'll watch your value go up as the market continues to decline. And they, they were thinking later, not late, but I'm um, the later half of 2023 is when that's going to happen but we're not there yet they're still going to do a, a couple more uh couple more tranches of you know reining it in because they do not they know they do not have inflation to control yet so it's really it, god kevin i hope this i hope this won't 
I hope this uh, podcast helps people. This has been a great call. I really enjoyed talking with you, but uh, man, it's, um, l- listen, you and I are going to be around, God willing, and that's the only thing we have going for us is God is 10 years from now, and we're going to look back and say, like, we made millions off of this because we lost millions the, for the last time around. I've already been through, uh, I'm, I'm not in my studio right now, but I have a, 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 um, a book, Big Shifts Ahead, um, and uh, Chris Porter and, and John, I can't remember, John Burns. And uh, I had Chris Porter on my podcast, and I and I interviewed him about all the stuff. And and the, the they, you know, they they changed the, the terminology for all the generations. They don't call them the, you know uh, um, the uh, uh, baby boomers, Gen X, Gen Y. They broke it down into decade long uh, generations. And you know, I, I'm a lot older than you are. I can tell just by looking at you, because uh, you know I'm 72 years old. Okay, that's usually followed up with. You look really good for seventy two. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. I was just so stuck in you. I was like, All right, what's what's he gonna say? I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what these guys did. You look fantastic. Thank you, There's Kevin. no that's way you're seventy two. I'm that's not buying that for a second. Nobody ever says that for not even one second. No, nobody ever says that for fifty eight. Um, but they said people born in the sixties are going to retire with the least amount of equity per capita or, or you know, uh, fixed for inflation than any other generation. And the reason is because we are the only generation that has lived through three cycles and we're about to go through our fourth. And, you know, Kevin, I'm a slow learner. It's taken me three, ge- three cycles to learn how, st- how to get my head stopped from being bashed in. And so this one, I'm sitting back on the sidelines, keeping my powder dry, and going to wait and watch. And, uh, you know, that, that's, the, that's the plan. And uh, I, that's what I'm teaching my students. So I think it's smart. Whether yeah. you're right or I'm right, I still think that's smart. There's going yeah. to be some, I don't think anybody's arguing that we're either in or headed into a recession. And I don't think yeah. that anyone is going to argue that this is a direct attack on housing and, and real estate. And there's going to be some softening. I'm not arguing that at all. Yeah. I'm just not seeing anywhere near what we saw I in 2008. I, I just don't think that's possible based you know, on the fundamentals that we're, we're seeing. And yeah, I think that there's a lot of dry powder on the sideline also. Like you, when you start seeing prices come down, people just like you are going to start investing back in real estate. And I think that's going right. to create a floor. So, we'll, I mean, I guess we'll see this play out. But Okay, let me tell you. Where I totally agree with you is that the differences between this and 2008, and and I and I this is this is what I said to Ivy. I said, but the, the difference between then and now is we have sound underwriting. Back yes. in 2008, if you could fog up a mirror, you could get a commercial loan. That's, right. That's right. Today, no, you need a KP. You need to be, you know, know what you're doing. You need to have uh, have a history behind you, and they're much smarter about it. We didn't have the inflation. We didn't have the amount of money that was flooded into the market by the government like like we did back then. And that's the thing causing this. We have this huge, this, you know, two-headed animal. We did in, in 1990. We well, did back then, that. that. Yeah, but we didn't, but, but that was almost like an organic inflation. That was a combination of unsound underwriting and inflation, and we only lost values of 14%. Yeah, yeah. And now we have more money created in the last forty percent of the of the M two has been created in you know in the last uh, twelve months than in the last gener- forever. That is just devastating this economy. It's 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 most re- and then they're talking about you know it'll never happen with the student loan debt. It'll never happen. It'll never happen. Um, but, uh, but even just the thought of them doing that is so ridiculous. It just shows, it shows us that we got a bunch of drunks at the wheel. Uh, if these guys are thinking about doing something like that, that, that would just be devastating, devastating this country, not only from a financial standpoint, but just from a, a, a class, a class standpoint. You know, the college class versus the, the hardworking, you know, blue collar class. The, those guys don't deserve this shit. That's crazy. That's exactly yep. right. All your, all your buddies. Did you go to college, Kevin? I did, yep. Okay. But how many of your uh, 
How many of the guys that you were dropping mortars with went to college? Less than half. I don't know. Exactly. Exactly. So those those less than half are going to be paying for your college or your kid's college. It's just it's just not right. It's just not right. Bullshit. Yeah. Going to the military if you went to school paid for. Yeah. Yeah. I'm all for that. That's totally cool. I told my dad I would do that. He said, Charlie, you can go to any college you want, but the tuition checks are going to Boston College. I said, damn, <laughs> damn, I don't, I want to go to Villanova. I want to go to the Navy. So, um, but all right, anyway. So, hey, Kevin. Oh, so I really appreciate being on your podcast. And, um, and <laughs> I appreciate your, your being so patient with me. For those of you in the back, uh, you don't understand that uh, I had a little payroll issue that Kevin had to, had to, I was on hold with my payroll company and Kevin had to sit back and watch that whole episode play out. But uh, he was kind enough to stay on here and I really, really appreciate it. So Kevin, Kevin, give me your pitch. Pine Financial Group, you got your sign up behind you. What's, yeah. um, tell me about how we can deal with you, how we can get a hold of you. Yeah, I think we're very similar, Charles. I think we should be looking at more investments in Wall Street or in Main Street over Wall Street. I think Wall Street's a very scary place. Main Street, you have much more control. You can understand the assets. They move more slowly. You could generate income. So we put together a mortgage fund. It's a public fund. We've got all our approvals with the SEC to um, <clears throat> promise an 8% return. And we use that to make loans to real estate investors to do what you're talking about. Yeah, uh, We do a lot of fix and flips, a lot of commercial value add. Um, so if you're looking to keep up with inflation, at least keep up um, and not have to worry about that volatility, that's one option for you. Um, otherwise, we, we make loans on, on value add stuff. So if you're looking to get leverage into a property and maybe re limit the amount of partners you bring in, uh, we base our loans on the stabilized value so we could get to a much higher loan to cost ratio. Um, so that would be another way we could work together. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. Kevin, Kevin Alma. Kevin Amos. Hey. I had to correct Kevin you. Amos in America. <laughs> I will never call you Kevin Amos. Back in the homeland, we never spoke that way. So pinefinancialgroup.com. Kevin, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, and there's a, a, I give a free report if your listeners want it. It's pinereport.com and it's, uh, it's, it's how to stay safe if you're out there lending money at other people. So I see, I see people get into this business without knowing what they're doing and they make mistakes like investing in a junior position or not getting the right insurance on the property and, yeah. and they're losing everything. So I wrote a report to help keep you safe. It's just Perfect. the pinereport.com. Kevin, thanks so much. All right, Charles. Great talking with you. Buddy. Awesome. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon.